What's up everyone, welcome back to Fish and Hex. Today we are on our fifth video in the beginner guide series to reef tanks and today we're gonna to talk about LPS tanks. So let's get right into it. Who should have an LPS tank? Well, anyone who's been doing softy tanks for a period of time and ready for that additional challenge, this is for you. Um, and, but, and if anybody is in love with frog spawn and hammer corals, this is definitely for you. Most people who go to the fish store are in love with those corals. And uh, well, it's an LPS coral, so dig on in, right? So let's move on. If you're willing to move on from a softy tank into an LPS tank, be aware that there's a couple things that you need to change. Your maintenance schedule is going to have to change a little bit. You're going to have to put more time into this tank. I suggest three to five hours a week. I do the majority of my maintenance on the weekend just because it works better on my schedule. I do do daily maintenance, uh, cleaning the glass, feeding the fish, feeding the coral, stuff like that. But my bigger maintenance, like water changes, moving coral around, fragging, uh, scraping the glass, all that kind of stuff, that happens on the weekends. Uh, that goes for water testing and all that stuff as well. That's all weekend kind of work. Okay. So if you're willing to put the extra time in to a reef tank, then LPS is a good good standpoint for you. It's a good starting point. Okay. So let's move on to what additional equipment you will need. Well, I recommend you have a better protein skimmer. So if you're just using the generic skimmer on a softy tank, I suggest you invest your money in and getting like a name brand, like a Bubble Magnus or something like that. Uh, uh, the Curve 7 is definitely some, is the one I use. I love the thing. But I suggest getting a higher end skimmer. Make sure it's double your water volume. And if it's not double your water volume or rated for it, make sure you get one that's at least a good name brand at the water volume that you currently have. So protein skimmer, you're definitely going to want that. And I personally skim wet. I've skim wet forever. And it's just, it requires you to change a skimmer cup a little more often. I do mine like every two to three days. So a lot of people like to dry, skim dry just so they only have to do it once a week. It's your call what you want to do. Uh, it's what your maintenance a lot, your maintenance schedule allows you to do. So get a bigger skimmer. Also, you're gonna have to start doing, uh, depending on your, your amount of LPS coral you have, dosing two part. Now I personally dose BRS two part. I also dose it on an automatic doser. Uh, that way I don't have to manually dose it, but you can manually dose for a short period of time. You'll find that it, you might forget it and your schedule doesn't allow it. So just be, a, be aware of that, that you might end up moving over to a dosing pump. So be aware that you'll have to purchase a dosing pump. So that's additional money that you'll have to put into it. Okay, so it does cost a little bit more money to have an LPS tank. Plus the corals are a little bit more pricier than a uh, soft coral tank. All right, uh, also if you uh, refractometer, if you didn't have one previously with a softy tank, you definitely need to have one with an LPS tank. This is because salinity is just very important. You need to keep track of it, it needs to be accurate, and the only way it's gonna happen with happen is with a refractometer. So get yourself a good one, calibrate it often, and uh, for example, I calibrate mine every two weeks. I just do it that way, regardless if it needs it or not, I just do it. And it just puts the ease at mind to make sure that everything is, is on par. So refractometer, got to get one. Now, as with testing equipment, uh, Red Sea test kits are definitely good. Uh, the Salifier, Sal I don't know, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I don't know, I don't have any of them, but I know that's a good brand. I've heard good things about them. So if you're using API generic saltwater test kit from Peco beforehand with a softy tank, cool, that works out great for that tank. But once you move into LPS and SPS, you need to make sure you're testing is more accurate. So you need to spend a little bit more money on a high quality test kit. Red Sea is definitely good. I've been using it for a long time now and I definitely, definitely like it. So I recommend Red Sea test kits. I'll put videos out in the future on how to use each one of those individually. It's on the list of to-dos, just an FYI on that. So now that we talk about water parameters and testing, let's move into what should my calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium be? With a LPS tank, I recommend a calcium of 420 to 450. I've seen the best growth in that, and uh, it really, when it comes to, because remember, you're dosing equal parts of calcium and alkalinity, and in my personal preference is to have a higher alkalinity of about an 8 to 9, 10-ish DKH, because I like to have my pH around 8.3. So in order to have that, that uh, pH at 8.3, you need to have a higher alkalinity and your tank needs to be uh, absent of CO2. So uh, I have a video out there, I'll try to find a link of it and put it in here, talking about all that good stuff as well. So your uh, calcium, 420 to 450, I keep it around there. 
DKH. You can have it anywhere between 11 and 7, uh, sorry, 7 and 11 DKH. Like I said, I personally like to keep mine between 8 and 10. Personal preference on my end. And then uh, magnesium, 1350 to 1450. I would personally keep it around 1380. That's where I like to have my magnesium out. Like I said before in a previous video, it allows a little bit of wiggle room when it comes to water parameters. So moving on to how often should I, you should you even test the water? Well, when you're first starting your LPS tank, I recommend that you test the water twice a week and uh, try to like three days apart, something like that, three to four days apart. This allows any changes that you make today to take effect between tomorrow and the following day and then be able to test that effect uh, the following uh, on the third or fourth day. That's what I personally recommend and that's what I've done. And once you start implementing two-part dosing, you're going to want to check it once a week for a little while. Once, you're, once your tank is stable, you're good to go. I know that uh, right now I check my alkalinity once a month. That's it. I don't even check calcium anymore. I check my magnesium once a month as well, but that's it. Uh, I know if my alkalinity is good, I know that my calcium is good. It's just the way it is. But uh, over time, I mean, I wouldn't do that right away. Don't jump into like, oh, I'm not going to test my calcium because you might be dosing too much calcium. Who knows? Uh, just uh, just get in the habit of toast, dosing everything on a weekly basis. It's a good habit to form. It gives you consistency in your uh, schedule as well. All right. Now that you're uh, choosing to dose two-part solution, uh, if you so choose to do that at this point, you will need to obviously dose equal parts of calcium and alkalinity. There's no reason not to. I stress that a lot because it's, people don't do it. So dose equal parts all the time. And I also recommend, depending on the stock and how many LPS you have in your tank, I suggest a 10 to 15 milliliters of both per 25 gallons daily, okay? It's a good starting point. It allows you some fluctuation. Check it in a week or so and uh, see where you're at on that. And that's automatic dosing. And you can also do it by hand if you so choose. I personally never dose two part by hand. I just kind of skipped it and went straight to dosing pumps. It's your call and do what you want. All right, moving on to water changes. I suggest a 10% every other week or 20% monthly. Depending on your bio load, you could do 20% every two weeks or a 40% monthly. It's your call what you want to do. Just remember if you take 40% of water out of your tank, that water you put back into your tank better be exactly the same temperature as for the tank water that you uh, currently have because uh, that's a lot of water and uh, you can make some serious fluctuations in water chemistry if you do that. So I, adv I advise doing a smaller amount more often. Your call, do what you want. Alrighty, let's move on to lighting. I recommend a quad T5 high output uh, system with two itinic bulbs and two 10K bulbs. Now I've seen people do, I've seen people grow LPS with dual T5 lighting. Uh, how successful they were, I'm not really sure. Uh, that was early on in my reefing days, that's just something I saw. But uh, I would recommend at least doing a four bowl fixture. You can really get a lot of power from those lights at that point. Now, if you want to move into LEDs, you can move into the eBay, Aquamars, uh, generic LEDs, uh, the SB Reef lights. Uh, they're all relatively good price between $100 and $150. Uh, depending on how many you got to get. I mean, if you have a four foot tank, you only need two. If you got a two foot tank, you only need one. And like that, and I have a six foot tank and I have three. So it just depends on how big your tank is and if you want to invest the money. But LEDs are great because they, they uh, move up with you. So when you move into your SBS tank, you kind of just crank them up a little bit more and you're good to go. All right. I would not recommend going out and spending $600 on a light fixture, but you know, you can do whatever you want with your money. I just know that people who have, excuse me, who have spent that kind of money on lighting, uh, especially with an LPS tank. Usually people who are just getting to LPS are not full-on reef junky people yet. They're not really invested invested. So I've seen people spend the money on lighting like that and then be done with a hobby next year and then they're trying to sell a $700 light on Craigslist. Well, I'm going to break it to you. If you've ever tried selling any kind of uh, fish tank equipment on Craigslist or resale value of fish tank equipment, it's not worth squat. So just be aware of that. Just because you spend seven hundred dollars on a light, and you think you're going to get five fifty, six hundred next year? It's not going to happen. Not even close. And if you do, whoever bought it's an idiot. The last option of lighting you can have is metal pilot lights. Now I have uh, never personally used them. I know that they generate a lot of heat, and that most people who do have this lighting system also have to invest into a chiller to keep the water in your tank stable. Um, I've never, like I said, I've never used it before, but I know that they have great growth and 
I've seen great growth in people's tanks that do have them. So they do work. If you want to put the money into them, you can. I do know that the bulbs can get pretty expensive, like upwards of a hundred plus dollars per bulb that you have to change out every nine months. That's uh, you know, depending on how many you have, it could be pretty bad. If it's only one, it's not so bad. If you have four or five, it's pretty crazy. So that's an option. Again, do what you want to do. I personally use a T5 high output slash LED combo. It's like a hybrid kind of thing. And uh, the T5 kind of fills in the shading while the LEDs do all the work. So that's my personal preference. That's what I do. If you've ever seen any of my canopy videos, you'll see that both lights are in there. Uh, how much flow do you need in the LPS tank? Not as much as an SPS and a little bit more than a softy tank. So I know that's not very helpful, but it's true. Basically, the whole point of flow is to make sure that you get detritus, detritus and all junk off of corals. It's basically cleaning the coral. The coral can rid itself of excess junk and waste and all that good stuff. So uh, I recommend wave makers on each side of the tank, as I always do. Those are a great option. If you can't get wave makers and you only have directional pumps, make sure that they are bouncing off walls of the tank and not blasting corals directly. If you've ever blasted an Ophelia, like a hammer or something like that, over time it will start shedding pieces of the coral. And, uh, and I always thought, oh, it's having babies. No, it's not having babies. You're killing it because you're blasting it with too much flow. So if your coral is sucked in and it's then dropping polyps because it's too much flow, then you need to move your power heads around. All right? So, I'm gonna cut. so that's uh, all you need to know about flow. Beginner LPS corals, chalices, frog spawns, hammers, torches, brain corals, trumpet corals, bubble corals and one of my favorites that I still haven't been able to get yet is the short tentacle and long tentacle plate coral. Those are two favorites that I'm looking to get. As you see here on the screen I have uh, two types of frog spawn and two types of hammer corals. Now I, I put them all together because they can touch each other and not kill, e not kill each other. That's why I have them grouped together. I have them away from all SPS and all that good stuff. And um, to the right which you can't see I have a torch coral. And uh, he can hang out here as well. They're all part of the same family. And uh, yeah, so there's, that's just a list of some of the corals you can get. Um, and they're very colorful. Uh, just an FYI, LPS corals don't grow very fast. So if you're looking for a tank that grows fast, LPS is not really the way to go. There's my auto top off. And uh, if you're looking for a fast growth tank, SPS is pretty much the only way to go. But we'll get into that in our next video. Beginner fish. As I stated before, I'm a, I very, I, I'm, I strongly recommend getting fish that you can grow with. So get the fish that are reef safe from the beginning. Tangs, damsels, clownfish, blennies, wrasses, most wrasses anyways. Um, and if you want, get an eel, get a lionfish. Um, you know, of course, there's tons of different shrimp you can get. Uh, just get fish that are reef safe from the beginning. That way, when you decide to move your tank around you don't have to get rid of your angelfish because he's eating your freaking hammer coral okay or ripping your zoanthids apart you know um i don't have i know i said this before i don't have anything against butterfly fish and, and angels i just know that uh i spent a lot of money on coral and i'm going to spend a lot of money on that fish and then that fish is going to eat my coral and if he doesn't awesome you're one of like one out of a hundred that you know got away with it but uh, most people that i've seen yeah it doesn't work out so well Use it all top off again. All right, all right, guys. So that's pretty much the whole video on LPS LPS tanks. I hope it was helpful. I hope I could provide some information for you. If you liked the video, go ahead and like it. Comment if you have any suggestions or if I missed something, just let me know. And of course, subscribe because I have more videos coming out. Our next video will be about SPS mixed reef tanks, and then we're going to move on to some other stuff for beginners. All right. So appreciate you watching. Thank you, and I will talk to you later. Peace.